Hi, I'm Cheryl Kagan, very proud to be the Senator for Gaithersburg and Rockville. Welcome to this week's edition of Kibitzing with Kagan, brief conversations with people I find fascinating. My special guest today is the really wonderful CEO of the Arts and Humanities Council of Montgomery County, Susan Jenkins. Susan, thank you so much for taking time to chat. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really excited about our conversation today. That's awesome. Well, we have so much ground to cover, so I'm going to dive right in. And I'm going to start with your childhood, because while you were a New York native, you got to uh, be raised in Trinidad and Puerto Rico. Talk about how that uh, influenced your your direction and your uh, tastes. I think it's everything about my uh, taste. My, uh, I'll tell you that um, my father is African-American. My mother is Italian. So I grew up in a biracial home where on any holiday, we might have uh, ribs and barbecue at my grandparents' house who were from the South and then uh, homemade uh, pasta and ravioli at my other grandmother's house. So growing up in this kind of multiracial environment and then moving overseas first to Trinidad and then to Puerto Rico, I really understood that the world is large and it gave me an opportunity to really appreciate and understand culturally that people come from different places but want all the same things. It was really exciting and I think it's informed me at every level of my life. Fantastic. Well, I was lucky enough to go to Tobago many years ago, but of, of the TNT, Trinidad and Tobago, I didn't get to go to Trinidad yet. Um, you ended up uh, coming to Maryland and got your BS and your MBA at the University of Maryland. So we are lucky to have brought you here. And then you launched a tremendous career. And I'm going to go through it really quickly so folks have your background, because mostly I want to talk about what you're doing now. Um, but you have worked at the Rhythm and Blues Foundation, the Smithsonian um, Institute, uh, the American Jazz Heritage uh, program, the Recording Industry Association of America, the president of the Jazz Alliance International, um, before we were lucky enough to get you as the CEO of the Arts and Humanities Council here in Montgomery County. Why don't you talk just as one clump of all of that as your background and how it informed and inspired your work here in Montgomery County? Thanks for that question, Cheryl. You know, I've been very um, strategic about my career. I wanted to have a career uh, where I was able to develop a portfolio that didn't look like anyone else. Mm -hmm. So when I started out in the arts, uh, when I chose to move into the arts, I was working in retail uh, as a systems analyst. Uh, and uh, I chose to move into the arts when I met my husband and I saw he was working in the arts and he looked happy all the time. And I, I certainly wasn't feeling that way. <laughs> So I, I began to think, okay, what is it that I will need? So one of my first forays was volunteering at a jazz organization. Then I started working for the Science Museum of Minnesota. I took my systems analysis in um, background and I and I leveraged it at the at the Science Museum of Minnesota. When I learned what I could learn about donor giving and that kind of thing, leveraging that, then I said, okay, I'd like to work at an arts organization. And then I began to pivot. And then I looked at people who were my competition for some of those jobs. And I looked at how I might be able to put things into my portfolio that they did not have. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at the progression of my career, First, it was a science museum. Then I went to a foundation, a, a relatively kind of private foundation. Then I went to a public, federal, bureaucratic organization. Then I went to one of the largest associations in the world. Then I went to a subset of that association. Then I taught at Loyola University yep. so I could get educational experience. Getting to that too, yes. And now I run a large local. And so everything about that if you look at that progression, everything was very measured and I determined how I could develop a, a portfolio that would make me attractive as I looked for the positions that I wanted for my career. 
So I was very proud to um, chair the search committee that hired you a million years ago. Uh, you started in 2008, which is just astonishing. Uh, and I served six years on your board. So, but a lot of viewers may not be familiar with the Arts and Humanities Council in Montgomery County. So why don't you give a sense, and it was before your time, but there used to be two different organizations, ones that, one that dealt with arts and one that was the humanities, and there was a marriage that at first was a little rocky and stuff. So why don't you give a sense of the history and, and the purpose of this really right. wonderful organization you lead? I'd be happy to do that. So um, in the United States in the 60s, um, uh, President Johnson uh, and others worked very, very hard to think about how to leverage federal support for the arts, and they developed the National Endowment for the Arts, and that was in the late 60s. And the idea was that money from the federal government would go to the National Endowment, and then it would go to the states, and everybody would be happy. But about 10 years in, it was found that the, the once the money got to the states, it was very difficult for the states to trickle down the money to local communities. So then in the mid to late 70s, local arts agencies were established. And so right now in America, Americans for the Arts, which is a national association that is a um, uh, 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 members from all in the arts community are members and they do a lot of advocacy for the arts. Uh, they they uh, have come up with an idea where national, uh, I'm sorry, local arts agencies in every state are able to then drill down and support local communities. Mm -hmm. Arts and Humanities Council of Montgomery County is the largest local arts agency in the state of Maryland. We serve about a million point two residents, 500 arts and humanities organizations and about 2,000. Yeah, individual artists and scholars are in our portfolio at any given year. And we fund uh, about a half of that or so, or more, depending on demand each year. Fantastic. Um, we should, uh, so the funding, the funding, there is federal funding, there is state funding, and then the county gives funding. Everyone says, well, I care about the arts. I'm an arts advocate. Every candidate, every person will say that, but it means something different. Arts and humanities cost money and it's taxpayer money in addition to private funding. Why don't you talk about, so be, be the arts advocate. What's the best reason to use taxpayer money to support the arts and humanities? Because the arts and humanities are the most agile economic driver that there is. We are still moving through a VUCA moment, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. We are moving through the pandemic and we are not finished yet. And it is important to understand that this sector was the first to close because of the proximity to the work we do and the last to open. And so being able to infuse a sector that is the most agile economic driver quickly and efficiently will allow us as a state, as a nation, as the world to recover much more quickly from these VUCA moments than if we did not do it. So it may not be intuitive to everybody why the arts and humanities are economic drivers. Why don't you do a little on the details? Let's go to a play. I'm going to pick you up and we first are going to have to pay the, your dog sitter. So the dog sitter comes in and, oh, we're going to give them some dinner. So we've got some dinner for the dog, dinner for the for the sitter, and we have ordered out. And so all of that money is right there local. OK, uh oh, you don't have any gas in your car. We've got to stop. We've got to get some gas. Then we're going to go. Oh, we have to pay for parking. Oh, and then we're going to get the ticket. And all of that is local money. And I'm going to pick you up tomorrow and the day after <laughs> and the day after. And you're going to keep dropping your money in my community because that is quicker than real estate. It's quicker than business deals. It is fast money that happens moment after moment. Right. And so that's the our part. On the, on the other part, if you're Roundhouse Theater or Olney or any of the arts or producers, uh, they are hiring 
the actors, the orchestra, the set designers, uh, the the makeup artists, the, all of that, and they're paying taxes. The carpenters, the, carpenters. the lighting, the lighting directors. And I say that because it's not just traditional artsy things. These are mm -hmm. carpenters, masons, mm -hmm. painters. Mm -hmm. These are people who in any other sector would be recognized, are recognized as small business. Yes, You invest in the arts and in the community because not only do you want the quality of life factors, but because these are pillars of our community. 100%. Um, so arts and humanities also engage or need to engage the whole community. And talk about, you've been such a leader in racial, racial reconciliation and remembrance at the national level as well as locally. Um, too often I go to a play and I'm like one of the youngest people in the audience and I'm the only one that doesn't have, you know, completely white hair yet. Um, how do we, um, ensure greater diversity among the patrons, among the donors, among the activists and supporters. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Well, one of the things that I'm really proud of is that the Arts and Humanities Council has an opportunity to make policies that ensure equity and access. Mm -hmm. So our guidelines and evaluative criteria for whether someone gets a grant is based on how well they serve the community that they say they intend to serve. Yep. So if you say that your community, you serve Wheaton, and you say we serve all residents of Wheaton, then I ask for evidence. Yes. But if I can't get evidence, then I have to ask more questions about why I can't get evidence. Yeah. So it's really important. And so some of the ways that we can ensure that people are reaching out to audiences and making sure that they're looking at diversity at all levels, mm -hmm. whether it's gender, age, geographic, racial, you know, access, Mm -hmm. No matter what the issue, we want to make sure that if you say, I serve this community, that I need to see evidence that you actually are. And if yes. you cannot provide that evidence, then I think we have to discuss whether or not your grant is having the impact or would have the impact of your intention. So let's talk about the grants that you just referenced. That's a big part, not exclusively, but a big part of what you do. So yes. let's start with individual artists. So yes. uh, so I'm a writer, a painter, a musician. Uh, how do I hear about it and how can I get support? And what's the level of support that I might be able to get? Well, I'm really, really proud to tell you that we have a system. Well, we have a very robust website. It's www.creativemoco.com. And I would encourage people to go to it. That and is we'll our- that, and I will put that on the slide at the end. Wonderful. That's more of our uh, internal facing website for applicants, for grantees, for the arts community to figure out what's going on. On that website, you can sign up for our newsletters and it gives you an opportunity to be the first to know of any openings for grant applications, job openings in the community, that kind of thing. We have several different kinds of newsletter and that's a way to be connected. We also are on Instagram, we're on Facebook. And so there are ways to connect to us through um, through social media. You didn't, uh, say, you didn't say Twitter. Is that on purpose? Did you get off of Twitter? I don't know how actively we're participating on Twitter. Okay. Some folks like are leaving in an Elon right. Musk right. era. Okay. Right. So I, I just don't know how long, how, how, how deeply we're participating. And I did leave it off because of my lack of knowledge. Yes. All good. All good. Uh, so right. I go to the website, I sign up for the newsletter. Right. How do I get money? But and we also hard. have, we also have, um, I believe it's called the grant generator. Okay. Um, I'd have to look at it again because we named it quite some time ago, but it allows you to click on that link and it it asks you a few questions that help take you to okay. the actual grant that you can apply for. So it's like, I'm an individual artist. Yes. I live in Montgomery County. Yes. I want money to do this, 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 this. Yes. 
This is the grant that you can apply for. Here are the dates that the application will be open. Here's a sample of last year's application. Here are the guidelines from the last applications. And here is a link to people who have gotten the grant. Amazing. Amazing. So it gives people an opportunity to, we've tried to do everything we possibly could think of to reduce barriers to access. Is and the language accessible? Is the language accessible? Is it, Our is it language accessible? Can I translate it into my you language? Can, you can translate it, but all it is important to note that all panel review guidelines and applications are submitted in English. Okay. Okay. So now let's talk about the organizations, 500 arts organizations. So there is a grants process and we are going to get to the whole idea of some people going outside the grants process, but let's start with the grants process. Um, there are large organizations and then there's like just the one neighborhood festival that's just a day or, or something that's more of an event uh, versus ongoing year round. Why don't you talk about how those work um, briefly as well? Again, one would go to the grants generator and they would <laughs> talk about what it is their organization does. And then we have the opportunity to then to see a list of those funding opportunities that are available, right. depending on the size of one's budget, depending on the type of management one has, depending yeah. on whether or not they're a community-based organization or an independent nonprofit. The grant, that information is fully and widely available on our website so that people can determine based on their budget size and what it is that like they'd like to do, you know, if they're looking for a project grant or if they're looking for general operating support, if they're an individual artist or scholar looking to do something or if they want to teach in schools, you know, um, are uh, in, in school programs or after school programs, each one each one of those different categories, one would go through the generator to find out when and, and all the other things that I mentioned previously. Is there anyone, any type that's precluded, that's not allowed? Can for-profit businesses apply for money? Can churches, uh, synagogues, and mosques apply for money if they're doing a concert? Is, it like, is there anyone who's not allowed? Well, I would say, I don't want to answer that in a blanket way, but to say that each different category has different eligibility. Okay. But overall, these are Montgomery County, Maryland taxpayer dollars. Yeah. So I'd say that the first thing is that for the most part, all of the grants that we have are intended for Montgomery County residents. Good. Good. Now, when I was on the Arts and Humanities Council, uh, there were some folks who uh, you know, stayed with colored within the lines. And then there were some who kind of did the work around and they leveraged the personal relationships and uh, and tried to get in the governor's budget or in the county executive's budget or, you know, work with a council member and something. Uh, how much is that still happening? And I'm not looking for you to name names of, of organizations. How big a challenge is that? And does that, um, does that, I don't know, undercut the the process or is that an okay add-on well I'll, I'll start by saying that earmarks are a traditional inequitable approach to getting support for funding for anything yeah and so if we understand the concept that you're starting out asking for inequity, mm. then I think as a state, as a county, as an individual, we have to ask ourselves, how does it jibe with our stated intentions for equity from our state perspective and from the local perspective? Right. I think that there are always going to be people who want or feel they need to color outside of the lines. But there are a whole lot of others who would never think about that mm -hmm. for so many different reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that it is a matter of ethics to ask ourselves if as a state, we say that equity is important to us or as a county, we have stated equity resolutions and goals Yes, that each time that we allow someone to move out of the system, that privilege entitlement that people have and feel 
that is all we are doing it. That's all we are doing. We're just leaning into more privilege and entitlement. Yeah. Okay. Until we can move away from that, uh, we cannot move into an equitable way of moving through our lives. Yeah. Fair enough. I totally agree. Um, so I have a million more questions. Um, how does Montgomery County, how does the Arts and Humanities Council of Montgomery County, if at all, work with the other 23 counties? Uh, or is it 24 silos, mostly each serving their own residents? I am the a former president of the County Arts Agencies of Maryland. Okay. Uh, we get together about three or four times a year and uh, talk about our successes and sometimes our pain points. Yes. Uh, we, we talk among our, ourselves often. I just recently hosted a lunch, frankly, uh, in Silver Spring for other colleagues from the region. So my colleagues from Arlington and Alexandria um, and uh, DC joined me. Uh, we often have lunches where we talk about our issues, public art and other other issues surrounding us, politics, yeah. sometimes that kind of thing. So we, we try to stay in touch with one another uh, as we move through issues. And in Maryland specifically, we talk a lot about uh, say how we might want to ask for support from the Maryland State Arts Council and what we might do with our colleagues, both from Maryland State Arts Council and for Maryland Citizens for the Arts. Uh, and I'm on that board also. Good, Good. yes. Um, so there's an instinct sometimes by Montgomery County residents to feel like they have to go downtown to see high quality art. Uh, they have to go to the Kennedy Center. They have to go um, to Virginia, the Signature Theater. They've got to go to the Hirshhorn or the whatever. Um, how do we educate folks that there's amazing high quality art right here in Montgomery County? Is that something you are focused on at all or do other organizations do most of that? Well, we have an outward facing website called culturespotmc.com. And on any, any given day, you can go to that website and see all the wonderful happenings that are in Montgomery County. We also uh, work with the organizations in our portfolio, excuse me, to um, buy cooperative marketing ads in um, MoCo 360, formerly Bethesda Magazine, and uh, other opportunities for cooperative marketing so that we can join together as forces and market our industry. Good. I think that when people, uh, there's, we can't deny that Washington, D.C. is evocative internationally. Yes, Think to to just feel as though uh oh what can we do? Um, people are going to D.C. Just recognize that we have we are powerless right. over the evocativeness of the nation's capital, right? Internationally, and That's we right. have Strathmore Hall right here, and we have right. the Fillmore right here, and I mean right there are a lot of national yes, right. So that said, the most we can do, I think, is market ourselves well and continue to uh, produce and present world quality work like I see being presented all throughout the county every yeah. single week. Amen. You know, we're marketing it and we are we are producing the work. All that's the best we can do. Absolutely. Um so and making it accessible. Let me add that it's not the best we can do. I'd like to go back, to walk that back a minute and say, you know, if we're producing it and we're marketing it and we're making it accessible. Yes. That's the important part. So part of the producing and marketing is also um, creating the next generation. And again, Absolutely. as we talked about, the diverse next generation. So again, you referenced earlier, you have been a professor at George Mason, at Loyola, at American University, uh, and you're focused on mentoring. So all of those things help lift up young people and engage them uh, with arts and humanities. Why don't you talk about either tell a quick story or tell us why you think those are so important for making sure that there's continuity and engagement? Oh, that's a really great question because, you know, so many times in my career when I've landed and, and they've been mostly management positions for a very long time. 
So, but when I've landed in those positions, people have basically said, whew, I'm so glad you're here. You know, it's not been easy for us to find an African-American, an African-American woman. And I think to myself, you're right, we're hiding. You can't find us. <laughs> um, and, and But then I step back and I ask myself, what are they really saying? Right. And what I heard was that I don't see you where I'm looking. Interesting. Uh -huh. So I thought, okay, what I need to do then is put people where you're looking. Mm -hmm. So by educating those interested in arts administration through any of those universities that you mentioned, through my mentorship work with women of color in the arts, mm -hmm. through my mentor and guidance with my staff and yes. interns that have come our way over the years, or through my work as a leadership coach, I am working really hard to make sure that we are scaffolding emerging leaders with what they'll need so that they get in the pipeline. And then when we're in the pipeline, then we can understand that it's time to apply equity, access, inclusion, because we're here now. Now you have to let us in and you have to create environments that make us feel welcome and that we belong. This you're you're making this so easy, Susan. Thank you. You just said environments. I'm going to make it singular, the environment. So you are focused uh, on the role of the arts and humanities in addressing climate change. And as I think you know, one of my nonprofit bills that has passed the Senate unanimously that we haven't gotten all the way through yet is to create a revolving loan fund for. Uh, nonprofits to be able to participate in the climate solutions through solar roofs, geothermal, or anything that makes sense. And so uh, Imagination Stage could put a green roof on, well, maybe they're, that's not the best example since they're in a parking garage, but but um, <laughs> like folks who can, who can uh, participate in it and have a revolving loan fund have lower uh, uh, energy bills while also helping reduce their carbon footprint. Tell me what some of your ideas have been um, to engage in in climate uh, the climate crisis. Well, you know, a past a past um, initiative was that after the economic downturn of two thousand eight, we had organizations asking us for more funding, and the county simply didn't have it to give. Mm -hmm. Um, um, and so we tried to figure out how we could get more with less. And so we developed the Nonprofit Energy Alliance, where we began to speak with nonprofits about what their utility needs were. And we were able, at that time, they were doing these bulk purchase of clean and renewable energy. And we were able to get a cohort of organizations together who bought their own clean and renewable energy. I was not buying it for them right. and I was not negotiating it for them, but we had someone who was negotiating the clean and renewable energy price, which was below standard offer, offer service. Mm -hmm. And then that cohort was able to then buy in bulk for a certain amount of time, clean and renewable energy. That worked until we got to a point where clean and renewable energy and standard office service were about the same price. Mm -hmm. um, so now we are, you know, working through public art to think about how can we work with stormwater management? How can we work with um, solar paneling? How can we think about kinetic art in communities that solves a few of these issues? Mm -hmm. um, and we are working with the Department of Environmental Protection um, on a new project that we'll be launching pretty soon. Um, at the Climate Crisis Center here in Montgomery County to bring uh, art um, and a, a feeling of belonging, safety, and well-being to those most vulnerable who are affected by climate change that that center serves. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, I just have two more questions before we get to our fast five. Uh, first, what are you proudest of during your tenure to date uh, at the Arts and Humanities Council? I think overall, I'm most proud of the way that we've been able to move through an economic downturn and a pandemic without losing the whole community in 
in the meantime. Mm -hmm. um, that coupled with the constant conversation about race equity and why it matters in a multicultural region like Montgomery County and not shying away from that, having my board adopt three really critical racial equity principles, commitment to brave conversations about race equity, commitment to sharing power, and commitment to the understanding that nothing about us without us can be for us. Mm -hmm. Adopting that as a board and then living that truth every day in the work I do, I'm proud of that. Fantastic, congratulations. Thank you. Um, so my last question for you is, you used to play the saxophone. Do you still? How often? And uh, do you ever perform or have you ever performed? I have performed in the past, but I don't perform now. Okay. Um, it's right here in my office. And okay. uh, I pick it up every couple of days uh, when I need grounding and I need that vibration in my body. Okay. Uh, um, it is... Uh, it's my security blanket. I love that. And your husband, Willard, is also a musician. So he is not a musician. He's a journalist. Oh, I thought he played also. I thought he was a jazz he's not. My no, he's a jazz journalist. Jazz journalist. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. My my phone. Okay. All right. Um, but we're both cultural warriors every day. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything we've left out or can we go to our fast five? Anything else you want to add briefly? I don't think we've left out anything. All right, cool. Well, Susan Jenkins, Fast Five, five quick questions, five quick answers to give folks a, a chance to know a little bit more about you. So question number one, what advice would you give to your younger self, something you've learned as you've grown older? Don't sweat the small stuff. Okay, good one. Question two, this one, you're not going to like this question. Who's your favorite jazz musician, living or dead? Oh, I don't have one. See, I, I, I'm not going to lot like that. I, 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 right. I, I don't have one because I love the music so much. Okay. Question three. What are you most grateful for? The work I'm able to do every day. Perfect. I didn't give a shout out to my interns who came up with some of these questions. Question four. Uh, after a long and stressful day, what do you do to relax? Have a martini. <laughs> nice. uh, and I just told one <laughs> there you go and my last question the one that I ask everyone Susan Jenkins CEO of the Arts and Humanities Council Montgomery County what is your hidden secret superpower what is a skill or talent you have something you're really good at that most folks can't do I'm a visionary I can see what could be possible for the future. And I can I can help people see it too. And I make it happen. Amazing. Myers Briggs, are you a big P then? Isn't aren't P's the the big P? I can't even remember. Okay. Right. Myers Briggs. Don't include that part. Okay. Very cool. <laughs> Very cool. All right. Well, it has been such a joy to see you to talk with you. And I really am grateful for all you do to um, to enhance the quality of life in Montgomery County and frankly, around the state and around the country. Uh, you are, you are um, featured uh, recently in the national press for the National Endowment for the Arts and so much of what you do is so thoughtful and effective. So thank you. It's great to be with you. Thank you so much, Senator Kagan. You know, I, I, I have loved knowing you these years and appreciated your advocacy and support. Thank you. Thanks. I'll see you again very soon. Looking forward to it. Take care. Bye-bye.